Good morning and welcome again to all of you who are joining together as one church family on YouTube or in one of the two morning services here at St Thomas Church, Trowbridge. This morning we're going to be dipping mostly into the first five verses of Philippians chapter 2. And I find it helpful to think about what I'm reading in the Bible in three different ways. So firstly, the historical context. Who wrote the message and who was it for? In this case, case, it's the Apostle Paul's message to the first century Philippian believers in their local church. Secondly, what can we learn for ourselves in the 21st century, particularly in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic and in our own circumstances? And thirdly, how can we use what we've learned to influence the future? So let's take a step back to chapter one by going into the prison with Paul. There he tells us he has literally a captive audience and recognises the opportunities it presents to tell people the good news of Jesus and also to encourage the believers in there who've been rounded up and thrown into jail. He makes good use of his time, ministering to those on the inside and writing letters to those on the outside. In this case, the believers in the church family in Philippi. Paul lets the church know he's in prison, but he assures the Philippian Christians that his imprisonment has actually served to spread the gospel because it's given him opportunity to witness to the imperial guard. In Philippians 1, 12 and 13, you can read a bit more about this. Paul emphasises this reassurance to counter any inclination on the part of the Philippian Christians to interpret his imprisonment as evidence that God's abandoned him which clearly isn't the case. So putting his own situation aside, Paul's writing to thank and encourage them. They face their own trials and have their own problems. We see in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, that they, like many churches today, have some petty disagreements and selfishness. And we know that if it doesn't stop, it leads to disunity and people feeling upset and marginalised. Paul's acutely aware of this and points them to a better approach to interpersonal relationships and gives them three examples they can imitate. Firstly, says Paul in Philippians 2 verses 1 to 2, firstly, in our relationship with God, treasure unity. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Secondly, in our attitude to ourselves, learn humility. And thirdly, in our relationship with others, serve willingly. Philippians 2 verses 4 and 5. So let's start with the first point. In our relationship with God, we need to treasure unity. And Paul's actually saying, if you've been united with Christ, and if the Holy Spirit of God indwells you, and your hearts are tender and compassionate, then find ways to agree with each other and work together. Have the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Agree wholeheartedly with one another. Work together with one mind and purpose. We should be living a life which begins by reflecting on our position as citizens of heaven and being united with Christ. The Philippians laid great store by Roman citizenship. They enjoyed Roman law, Roman culture, Roman holidays, and of course, Roman tax allowances. Roman citizenship was very costly and highly prized within an empire dominated by slaves. So Paul begins and plays on his theme by reminding them who they are in Christ, citizens of heaven. If this is who you are, says Paul, if you are united with Christ, then stop behaving like it. For some, this was going to mean a radical change of attitude. In order to change our lives, we need to change the way we think. Because change always starts first in our mind. Behind everything that we do is a thought. The way we think determines the way we feel and the way we feel determines the way we act. 
God revealed this thousands of years before psychologists understood it. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts, says the writer of Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Paul's saying, become like-minded with other Christians because you're united with Christ. Then we will become one in spirit and of one mind. In our attitude towards ourselves, we need to learn humility. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Over the years, we can probably all think of times when different personalities, agendas, visions and views have disrupted the unity and harmony of our own church and other churches. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? But having a right attitude towards ourselves mean we'll respect and value each other equally, regardless of positional status. And indeed, 1 Corinthians 12.23 tells us, to clothe the parts of the body that we consider less honourable with greater honour, and that those that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. We're commanded to have the same attitude of mind that Jesus had in Philippians 2 verse 5, to put aside any thoughts that may be self-centred and self-seeking and focus instead on the needs of others. Jesus said in Matthew 11 verse 29, these words, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Thirdly, in our relationships, we're told to serve others willingly. Not looking to your own interests, says Paul, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude and mind Christ Jesus had. Despite all that is unique and radically different in Jesus, he is after all God, we are commanded to have the same attitude, specifically his self-sacrificing humility and love for others. And at the Last Supper, when the disciples were having trouble over who was the greatest, Jesus took a towel and a basin and he washed the disciples' feet and in doing so redefined what greatness really is. So now we're going to leave Paul for a moment because I'd like to give you an example of how unity, humility and service is being played out in front of our eyes in the work of MAF or Mission Aviation Flying Fellowship which is one of the overseas missions that's supported by the St Thomas Church family. MAF was co-founded by Stuart King and he died in August 2020, aged 98. He was one of the early pioneers to take light aircraft to the remote parts of Africa in the aftermath of World War II. And Stuart used the skills he'd acquired in the RAF and together with a handful of RAF personnel, he began a lifelong worldwide mission to reach countless thousands of the most isolated, poverty-stricken and forgotten people using aviation and technology. And despite decades of political turmoil, hostility and rapid change, MAF ensured that the plight of remote tribes hidden in the mountains, unreached forests or near inaccessible swamps was slowly becoming known to the outside world. And a growing number of experienced and faithful pilots followed a calling to join the vision, adding to MAF's capability and scope to become an international Christian charity and the world's largest humanitarian airline. As well as their technical ability and skills, those who work for MAF are characterised by their unswerving faith in Jesus and humility often in the most difficult circumstances. Their faith and humility enable them to gain respect and credibility to work alongside governments, 
people, groups and individuals to take the love of God into their midst, to physically and spiritually transform them. And Rebecca, who was Stuart's eldest daughter, said this of her dad. Dad's life motto was always to be the best man he could in God in every season of his life. He strived to be the best bachelor, then the best husband, and the best father, and finally the best widower. He was always so determined and committed to math. He's an inspiration to us all. So let's recap. Firstly, in our relationship with God and to God, we're to treasure unity. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 21, these words. Father, that all of them may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. Secondly, in our attitude to ourselves, let's learn humility. While Bible knowledge and spiritual experience are two ways to measure maturity, that isn't the whole story, because the Christian life is about far more than creeds and credentials. It's also about conduct and character. Being yoked to Jesus, as we saw in Matthew eleven twenty nine. And learning from him means that we are living in a way that allows us rest because we are under the gentle and humble covering of his grace. Thirdly, in our relationships of others, we need to serve people willingly. Stuart King, the co-founder of MAF, used his God-given skills and abilities to inspire and equip others so that those who'd been forgotten by the world would know the love of the Father. Philippians 2 verse 4 and 5 reminds us that we too are commanded to have the same attitude as Jesus, specifically his self-sacrificing humility and love for others. When we truly need, learn to consider the needs of others before ourselves, then we too will also have taken a towel and a basin to wash their feet. In some respects, Nothing has changed since Paul wrote to the church family in Philippi. We have many of the same human weaknesses to deal with as we seek to become more like Jesus. In other respects, everything has changed. Certainly in our own experience in the last six months or so, our families, church and civic life have been disrupted by the coronavirus and perhaps more than ever for a whole generation in this country life has become really uncertain. However, in the midst of the worry and fear about sickness, jobs and education, we may find, like Paul, that we have a captive audience around us. If only we had the eyes to see. Although we're going to need to adjust and adapt how we do things, the future of the church still remains in our hands with the sure promise that Jesus will come back for his bride. So like math, let us live out the vision. For some, it may indeed mean taking the love of God to remote tribes and peoples hidden in mountains, unreached forests or near inaccessible swamps. Or could it mean for us that we take the love of God to our families, our neighbours, our offices, our schools, our health centres, supermarkets and shops. I will leave you to ponder that thought as we continue our service.